Any ones made of steel, in my opinion, would be a bad sight choice. I think most of those have kind of fallen to the side. I mean, most of the ones you're getting are going to be lightweight. They're functional. So many great ones to choose with, choose from. But let's go to this. Back to the POU. Let's say we're building a philosophy of use for our AR. It's going to be CQB. Close quarters, 0 to 200. Should you go irons? Should you go optics? We're going to transition optics right now in this discussion. Here's what I say now. You may not need an optic at all. Just go irons. It worked in World War II. It worked in the Korean conflict. It will work today. Iron sights I'm talking. Perhaps just as they come with a gun. Standard M4, M16 sights. You may not have to take them off at all. That'll save you a lot of weight. It'll save you a lot of time. It will probably save you a lot of money. Now, having said that, I want my carbines, no matter what the POU, to be a little bit more versatile because of where my eyes are. Because I want to identify the target in low light. Because I want to make a shot, perhaps, at 200 yards in lower light. Personally, I will have a very difficult time doing that with iron sights. Daytime, can do it. Not with the precision of an optic equipped AR, but I can do it. You need to decide for yourself if you even need an optic, is my point. You know, if a guy shows up to shoot with me, let's say we're just running sledgehammer, and I don't know what the drill's going to be. Maybe we're testing gun, maybe we aren't. And he doesn't have an optic on his AR, uh, he will generally be at a disadvantage on all the stages. He's going to shoot less accurately, slower. He'll probably miss a lot at the 200 plus ranges. Just speaking from experience, I can tell you that's how it goes. If the guy's really practiced, he's going to miss less, he's going to be faster. And I will respect it. Because if he says, hey, I do it for SAWC, I'm like, size and weight constraints. I'm like, that's cool. I mean, I have a super light AR-15. It's just fast into action. You're not going to beat just an iron sight equipped AR as far as speed into action. Think about it. It's just physics. I don't have a mount. I don't have a scope. Boom. Now, there are some super light, super tiny reflex sights. Burris, Doctor, or any number of other small, super lightweight, compact, red dot, or reflex sights. Those won't handicap you too much. Gun will still be super fast into action, and you do gain a night capability with such a gun. Speaking of which, I have one right here. This is a CQB gun for us. Okay, we're going to talk about how this gun is configured, and we'll continue to discuss this one as well, but this is what I'm talking about. I like red dot sights. I like EOTEX. They are not, for me, however, precision sights. It is a CQB option, defining CQB very loosely, 0 to 200, in this discussion. But remember what I said about iron sights. They're the cheapest. They're extremely durable. Yes, you too can learn how to shoot them well. They do have disadvantages. We talked about some. Harder to identify the target. Low contrast. Not so great at night. If your eyes you know, start aging, not so great. Get an optic. But if you want to save weight, you want to not hang more crap on your guns, don't put BUIS on them at all. You can see I do not subscribe to that principle because I like A plan B. Especially if I have an electronic sight with batteries. Something that can break. And by the way, all optics can break. That's why pretty much on every gun you see at the table, I'm talking AR-15s, they will have BUIS on them. That's just me. I will take the extra four ounces, more or less, for the sights. Going back to scope, so really ground yourself here with philosophy of use. I talked about the red dot, red dot, very briefly. I still have that video out there, Aim Point versus EOTech. It's been out for seven years. You know, guys are still always watching that. I still feel the same way. They're both excellent sites. There's some other brands. I mentioned just a couple. You decide if you need them. Generally, though, I think for a close to medium range AR, you should have some magnification. But don't overdo it. 
And when I say don't overdo it, really watch the weight of the scope you choose. In the background, that Smith & Wesson AR-15, MP-15, formerly Magpul Edition, is wearing the Weaver 1 to 5 power model number 800364. I think I said that earlier. This is a great scope. 30 mil tube, 1 to 5 power. It is illuminated, has a cert reticle on it, four and a quarter inch eye relief. It's 15 ounces, which isn't super light, but it's illuminated. Firepower versus mobility. Do you need illumination? Really look at that. I love this. You probably man. don't need it. In that case, save yourself the weight, save yourself the money. It might be like $200 cheaper. If you say, I don't need an illuminated reticle, I don't see myself shooting after dark. In which case, you're going to get a scope that weighs 10 ounces. I think the best overall optic range is like a 2 to 7. That's all me. I've said that in my best AR-15 scopes video I posted like 5 years ago. 2 to 7 is a great range. 3 by 9 is a great range. You can still shoot really close with it. You know, from here to the wall, maybe not the best choice. In that case, go with a reflex red dot or 1 to 5 power. I would not put this scope on any gun where the POU is to shoot beyond 200 yards. A lot of guys do. And I'll represent that here. They do. Like, I don't have a problem with that at all. I shoot one to four in competition, out to 600 yards, I freaking nail it. I hear you. I don't see it in my own shooting out in TMP. I don't. Guys who bring out low magnification get owned. It's been that way ever since I did TMP. Always. Keep in mind, the targets we are sometimes shooting are those small plates. 10 inches, sometimes 12 inches in diameter, sometimes not a lot of contrast. A lot of, can't speak, a lot of contrast. So against the desert, that black blends in, it's kind of hard to see it with a four power at 300 yards. Uh, here we go again with guys on the internet acting like it's easy. It ain't easy. It's harder than heck to hit that, especially with a four power scope. You have a three to nine totally doable and here's the funny thing when I shoot with guys to those stages if they have a variable power scope check this out they always have it cranked to maximum power almost always unless it's like a sniper scope you know 12 power maybe not like I've, I've run 12 powers out there I usually don't put it on 12 power I'm around nine ish but if they have a six power scope they have a seven power scope always cranked which tells you something. It's like, I want to see this target. I can't identify it. I need to zoom in on it. You're going to have a lot harder time with no magnification. Just from what I've seen. Let's go to the philosophy of use of SPR. And I'll roll in some footage here of just such a gun. Now, this gun is going to have a heavier optic in my way of thinking because its job, again, is to range out farther. I need more magnification. I probably need some dials, which I can adjust easily. I may or may not need illumination. I'll make a determine on, on that gun by gun. Generally, I think you should shoot for a scope around 17 ounces if you can get away with it. Some guys roll and go, oh, US Optics is good. You know, Night Force, good. I, no argument with me about how good they are. You will have an argument on several of their models of how darn heavy they are. And it's not just those brands, it's all types. You know, Vortex, Leopold has heavy scopes, Burris has heavy scopes, they all do. And yet you'll see these guys run them on their guns all the time. One of the biggest things you can do to dick up your AR is to put that heavy optic on it when you don't need it. If I were to ground this conversation again, I would say most y'all, and I'm talking to my TMP audience here, I don't, you, if other guys show up, welcome to watch. But I'm not really talking to you. I'm talking to guys who sub and support me in the project. Most of y'all need a gun from 0 to 200 yards. These guns on the table, copy these builds. Put exactly the stuff I put on them and you'll be good to go. Good to go. You don't need more than that. Hey, nothing. You said you like 2 to 7 scopes. I do. For me, I do. But keep in mind, I'm running drills out in the desert. If you're building a defensive carbine... Want to defend home and life, WROL, chances are the shot's going to come well within 100 yards, probably within 25 yards. You don't need a 2x7 scope for that. You may not need a scope at all. 
So if a guy has a red dot on it, he comes out shooting, he'll probably flail on some of those targets out there. And he goes, yeah, I don't want to do anything because this is a 0 to 25 yard gun. I'm like, okay, I respect that. that. That's a guy who's put some thought into his philosophy, that's why I use that word, of use. It's like, oh, I don't want to spend the money. This is really a 0 to two, 25 meter gun. Awesome. Super smart answer. Another way you can dick up the optic is by the mount. I'm not talking about buys and purchase, but I'm saying the one you choose. This is a LaRue mount. It's super light. It's super awesome. I could probably do without the vertical ring split. I generally don't like those. For me, they're just hard to get air. Not so much on a red dot, but with a crosshair to line them up and get them all straight. I hate it. It's a pain in the butt. I don't care what anybody says. I've done it so many times. It's always a hassle. Vertically, I'm sorry, horizontal split rings, I much prefer. These are expensive, though. They're about 200 225 a piece. There's more cost-effective options out now. You should look around. And we're talking about mounting, in this case, this is an ML2 aim point. All types of variations. This here, the Weaver scope, again, 1 to 5, great scope, uh, is wearing a very cost-effective Weaver SPR mount, and that is the old style with the old screw screws. I think now they have thumb screws on it. But this mount, dudes, 50 bucks, 6.4 ounces. That's what I'm talking about. And when I said copy these builds, just get a Weaver SPR mount, dude. It's going to put it at the exact height. You don't have to put any risers on it. You can see it easily clears BUIS, right? It stays on. Hey, but it's not quick release. Um, I've said this in some other videos. I'll hit it here again. You don't want to be taking it off because you'll lose zero. This mount, a LaRue mount, the Knife Force mounts, so we've taken them all off, and you usually are way off when you put them back on, no matter what the manufacturers say. You'll just leave it on. It, I like the idea of quick release, or at least a thumb screw release, but I, I pretty much take a polymer hammer, like a gunsmithy hammer, and I kind of knock these. I, t -t 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 -t, I really tighten them on. So I cannot easily undo these with my fingers anyhow. If I have to, I'll use a freaking magazine in an emergency, and I'll just take that, and I'll knock them free that way. I don't care if my gun gets scuffed up, if I have to transition to BOIS under the scope. Here, they're co-witnessed. So they're, I can just pop these up and shoot right through, you know, the optic. Don't dick it up with a big, heavy mount. Now, granted, the Weaver SPR does not have MOA built into it, this version. Maybe they have some out. I missed it if they do. But I don't need it for this gun. This is a 0 to 200 meter gun. I don't need MOA built in. If I go to an SPR build, you'll see every mount I use have MOA. My favorite these days, even though it's really expensive, Night Force Unimount. Clean. Horizontal rings. MOA built in. It's, it's expensive though. But it's light. Super lightweight. And I, I, I like that. Watch very carefully about the mounts you choose. So many guys will screw that up. Got to press. <coughs> Not much we can talk about the upper and lower receivers because they're so standard. With established technology, we're talking 70-75, T6, maybe a billet receiver. There is one thing you should watch out for. And that, and speaking of billet, is some billet receivers are built really thick because... They're trying to convince a customer, hey, this is stiffer than a mil spec or a military type specification receiver. You're going to shoot more accurately. I, I don't buy any of that. For my shooting, I've seen no difference between billet and forge receivers at all. I generally just prefer a forge receiver. It's going to be lighter in profile. It's not going to be as thick. It's going to be lighter is the main reason. Some billet ones are going to be looking cool and they're going to add about four ounces to your gun. So I guess we can't talk about the lower. Choose your lower correctly. Yeah, but it's got this feature. It's got the flared mag well. well here we go again. If, it, if your POU is competition gun, then okay. That weight, probably smart. If it's not, ah, I'm not buying it. I, I, don't, I don't buy the argument at all. Yeah. That takes us to the magazine choice. Another place, guys are hanging too much crap off their AR-15s. For instance, do you need more than 30 rounds? And I'm not talking in terms of political crap. I mean, if you want to have 100 round, I say it's your right and option to have them. Have 100 of them. I'm talking practicality. No, you don't. Practically speaking, you don't. 30 should be able to take care of most situations you ever run into. 
if you ever get into a firefight, <laughs> dude, I hope you don't. Just have more 30s. They're easy. Look how slim these are. And these aren't super light when they're loaded. Pop quiz, how much? That's right. They're a pound a piece when they're fully loaded. So you have eight of these on a level two loadout. That's eight pounds just in magazines. Now, if you opt for this, and I think this is a great mag, the Surefire Extended Capacity Mags. These are great for high firepower type magazines. They're one of the best. And there's a lot more. I just had this one handy, so I'm just rolling it in. You know, maybe it makes sense in a certain philosophy of use, but I'm not going to walk around with this clipped into my gun. There ain't no way, unless I know hell is coming. If hell's coming, I'll have this, maybe a C-Mag clipped in. Uh, that's different. That's like, okay, we know things are going to cook off. For instance, if I'm a SEAL team member, I'm, I'm inserting, you know, I'm providing fire support off my M4 or whatever gun I have. Yeah, I'll, I'll have max firepower. But that's a very specific application, dude. Standard speaking, I would say 20 and 30 rounders is all you need. And it can go really south in terms of weight. C-Mags are heavy. All the double snail magazines, heavy. There are some lighter options. But ask yourself, do I need the bulk and the weight? Generally, it's going to fall into the category, you have too much crap hanging off your AR. Yeah, I see these guys with a stack magazine side by side. I'm like, that's stupid. I don't like that. I'm like, you don't need that. Well, I need to do a mag change super fast. Well, you probably don't. But let's say you did. That's what your LBE is for, dude. Why weight down the very gun that's going to save your life? By weight, putting more weight on, on it, it's slower into action. It's harder to carry. It's going to be bumping into more crap. You're more likely to break things off of it. Keep it slim, trim, light, high speed. Especially for the POU of CQB, Close Quarter Battle AR-15. Says me. When you get into a longer range AR, it's different. We're going to hang more stuff off it. Watch your magazines. Heck, I have this over here on the floor. I'm going to grab it. I think this is a Lancer 10 round. No, it's DPMS. This is a cool mag. You want to talk about light? Just 10 rounds. I love this magazine. It fits like almost flush in the well. That's not a like a go to war, but this is, I'm bringing this in front of the camera to prove a point of lightweight. Got to press on. Watch your mags. How about the four inch? How about this is where a lot of guys screw it up. They go with a quad rail. Heavy quad rail, goofy. Rock River for the longest time was producing these quad rails, but they had a ton of metal on them. Then they had a half rail on them. When I saw them, I was like, those the guys, those, those got to be improved. Luckily, they changed them. There, fortunately, are so many great foreign choices for your AR. But look at this one. So this is a CQB. Notice I just went with the Magpul. MOE 4 in, dude. It's not free-floated because this gun's job is not to be precise at long range in this particular application. I could have easily changed it. Maybe one day I will. But for now, I just like, that's lightweight. It works. I put a couple polymer rails on it. It stays. This gun is basically the same option. It's just a little bit tweaked. So I go with a Troy Alpha rail, which I still love. And guys are like, oh, try this rail and try that white rail. I'll go back to what I opened the video with. Oh, Troy came out with it first. It's awesome. It still works. Why should I sell this, spend more money to get something else and flowery? To impress people? <laughs> Hell no, I'm not doing that. It still works. Troy still gives 10% to TMPers, so that rides. Love them. Trim, slim. You can put rail sections on as you need it. Yes, that adds more weight, but it gives more capabilities. The rail. You can really dick it up. Some guys like to hot, hold their gun way far forward. We see that all the time, right? It adds a lot of weight. They'll put a low profile gas block on. On a 16 inch barrel they are, their forehand runs all the way up here. For a defensive carbine, I eh, don't know if that's the best choice. For a competition gun, maybe it is. Remember what I said? Because then the guy is holding it. It gives him a competitive advantage of microseconds, of seconds, where the top competitors are, you know, from... Numbers one to five, maybe they're only separated by one second. So anything you can do to shoot faster, maybe it's worth it. It's a game. They're playing. They're competing. <laughs> Go lightweight, super trim, tons and tons of great manufacturers out there these days you can choose from. 
you'll probably peel off the forend that came with your gun because you won't like it. Sometimes it does, and another reason I free floated this one is it has a pencil barrel. More or less, it's a thin barrel. So if I do crank three max through this, I really start heating that barrel up uh, in this application, I want to free float it. This is not free floated, but it's also got a freaking heavy Bushmaster old school barrel on it. It's really thick under that handguard, so it can take it. Next up, gas blocks. <laughs> this is fun, by the way. Gas blocks, you can also dick it up here. You can put on a steel gas block. I mean, if it's if a gas block is steel, everyone's like, well, you have to have a steel gas block for reliability. No, you don't. Even competition guys run running aluminum gas blocks. You know, if you... Do I have data to say that if you shoot 7,000 rounds, aluminum is better than steel? No, I don't. Maybe then, it, it for super high use or full auto application, it makes sense. But I go with low profile, lightweight. This one is wearing an extended PRA, PRI gas block, kind of like I attempted to run on that LaRue, whose gas hole is drilled incorrectly, fixed it with a freaking hand drill. This is the one I did, and the idea was to increase the sight radius. So this gun has run with irons only in its life. It was only later I put on the aim point. That's why this is riding up here. This is made of steel, but notice how it's constructed. It's not bulky. It's pretty trim. Locks into position. Yes, even with screws. Hey, you need to roll pin it. No, you don't. I say you don't at all. It works fine. Well, again, go look at what the competitors are running. You'll see... You'll see this. This is a JP Enterprises gas block adjustable. And I just had it and I was like, I'm going to, and I had to take, this came with, this is one of the annoyances, this gun, it came with an M16 M4 front sight base, FSB. I didn't like it, got in the way of the optic, I'm peeling that off. I had this one in inventory. I like the adjustability, just for the heck of it. I put it on, it's awesome. Super lightweight. When you come from this point forward on your AR, this is where running crap on your gun can really affect how you shoot it because the swing weight is going to be affected. Right about here forward. Let's start with bipods. I see guys all the time running around on their ARs. They got a bipod on it. If you're talking SPR, long range AR, makes sense, right? Standard AR, philosophy of use, CQB, maybe even a competition rifle. Ah! I'd look at it really closely. And this is a cheapo UTG bipod. As far as bipods goes, it's pretty light. It's pretty darn lightweight. You can't beat it. 11 ounces. This freaking Harris. Here's that list I was telling you about. 15.4 ounces. This is a list I'm talking about, dude. Look at this. Through the years, and I'll just let you peruse this. Everything I have, I, I write that weights down. If you don't watch the ounces, you're going to cry about the pounds. This is just... Uh, this document of mine is like... 18 pages long. I'll let you look at this. There's that LMT SOP mod. Tube and stock alone were 20 ounces? <laughs> what? Bushmaster. And we're going to go here in just a second. Heavy 16 inch barrel weight difference between fluted and regular was 6.4 ounces. That's a lot. Hey, I didn't talk about that. I'm kind of, that's why I highlighted it. What about buffer spring? Hey, I really like that JP Enterprises silent spring. It's a capture spring system. I can tune it, adjust it. Awesome, you're gonna gain two and a half ounces with that addition. JP makes that for competitors. Smooth, fast, accurate. Some guys will put that, and I, I have too, I put it in that LaRue. Some guys will put that in there and they'll run it and say, hey, for my, just know you're adding two and a half ounces, probably unnecessarily. Look at that, that Night Force 1.125 unit mount, 4.8 ounces. Dude, that's two ounces lighter than the LaRue mount. LT-104, LT-158 are 6.8 ounces. I could go on all night for that. Rock River Arms cantilever mount. Dude, that thing sucked. 10 ounces? Yeah, it was $45. That's what I'm talking about. As a mount, though, you're saving some money, but you want to throw a 10-ounce mount on there? Forget it. Weaver SPR. I already talked about that. 6.4 ounces. Kind of cool, huh? I recommend you do the same thing. You keep track of your systems. That way you can fine-tune them over time. Back to the bipods though. Am I going to hang this off the CQB gun? In the very slight and improb improbable chance I'll be using it. Why is it improbable on a CQB? Because you're not going to have time. If you get in the thick of it and you are shooting for your life, do you think you're going to have time to extend your bipod? 
pick the perfect shot? No, it's going to be snapshot. It's going to be fast and furious. It's going to come quick. You push it out a bit, 400 yards, 300 yards. That's to me when a buy, well, not even that far. 100 yards when you have time and you have cover. Not just concealment, but cover. Says me. What do I know? Oh, I'm just a YouTuber. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> How about VGs, man? This is funner than heck for me, by the way. You can dick it up here, too. There's there's like heavy, heavy aluminum VGs there. I've been to the trade shows before, and I walk down the aisles, and I see these ridiculous long vertical grits. They're hanging off the forend. They weigh like eight to nine ounces. Yeah, but you can carry batteries with this. I'm so glad I thought of that, by the way. You want to carry batteries in your AR? You're going to add another three ounces, four ounces of batteries? Yeah, but dude, you're wearing a battery sight. You need to have extra batteries. Well, I say change them out. Carry the extras if and when you have to carry them on your person in your LB, not on your gun. Make your gun light, fast, and action. I definitely wouldn't put them in the vertical grip. Where Remember the point that I arbitrarily picked right here for? You want to make it as light as possible. Don't hang anything off there that does not directly contribute to your weapons capabilities. Says me. This is a Tapco. Super small. VG. I love this one. It's one of my favorites. It's lightweight. Affordable. Do I need anything more? I like the mini Magpul ones too. And there's others. Here's a Troy one. Looks cool, right? Uh, four ounces. Why? Because it is billet aluminum. Hey, this is one of the ones I was just talking about, by the way. It has a little battery compartment. To fool you into thinking you should take extra batteries with you. Don't do it. It's too much crap on your AR. Don't do it. I wouldn't run this. On my guns. At all. Wouldn't do it. And there's a lot more that are a lot more ridiculous than that. Now, some guys say, well, I like that one, you know, one's integrate a bipod feature. It's a VG and a bipod. Uh, I don't hang those on my gun. I can see the utility of them. I know they've been used by the soldiers to a certain extent. The reason is it's very long. And it's sticking way down. What if I got to go prone? Now it's interfering with my prone shot. Potentially, it might be interfering with shooting from behind cover. I, I don't know. I'm just not stoked on them. And they are larger and heavier. Granted, they do integrate a VG and bi bipod capability into one unit. But again, do you really need a bipod for that shorter range AR? I say no. Pushing on. Barrel. Another place we can totally dick up our AR-15. And when we're talking about, hey, dude, you're hanging too much crap off your AR, it, we're talking about accessorizing it, obviously. But we're also talking about, and you've probably figured this out, choosing the components smartly in terms of weight. So it may not be that you're hanging too much crap off your gun. It may be you just chose stupidly heavy components. So we can look in an AR and go, hey, that looks okay. It looks like it'd be about seven and a half pounds, eight pounds. We lift it up and we're like, oh, geez, dude. Why? Well, he's got a thick billet receiver. He's got a nine ounce optics mount. He has a PRS stock or whatever. I'm not picking on PRS or whatever. LMT stock. <laughs> he's got a... You know, maybe he opted for a steel magazine. I forgot to mention that. Some guys say, well, I don't trust aluminum. I do. I trust B mags. I trust aluminum. Well, I need steel. There was a move a few years ago about, oh, you got to shoot steel. It's really, really tough. It's a joke. The ones out there are fine. These, these mil-spec GI aluminum will last you forever as long as you don't abuse them. I'm shooting ones that are like 20 years old. I just did a refurb on them. You know, different base plate. Replace a spring follower. They're still running. They were meant to be disposable, but I know they still run good. But the barrel is is a critical component. I showed you on the list that generally four to six ounces will be gained if you don't flute the barrel or if you don't have a pencil barrel. I have had some prejudices against pistol barrel. I am developing and maturing in that respect. In that respect, I'm still immaturing a lot otherwise. But that, in that respect. I, this gun particularly, the way Smith & Wesson cuts its barrels, 4150 steel, 5R, 1 and 8 twist, that's a great barrel on that gun. You want to talk, look at that tabletop review when I come out with it. I'll show you the accuracy. It is tight. Lightweight too. With no special technology. It's not carbon fiber. It's just standard 4150 steel. It's a smart barrel. I, I'm beginning to think guys who run pencil barrels are really smart. 
They figured it out. I took a little while, but I still have a little bit of prejudice, but I've matured. I can see a reason. Hey, my POU is CQB. Zero, let's say zero to 300 yards, pencil barrel. I can't fault the guy at all. I was like, well, I see you. I see what you're talking about. If it's a quality barrel, it's going to shoot accurately for a realistic amount of rounds. What I've always said is, hey, I will go with a heavier barrel. Is if I have to do mag dump after mag dump, things get nasty. And I still want a heavy barrel. More stable. It won't start slinging shots. I feel more comfortable shooting out of that barrel. That's why in the inventory, we still have a heavy barrel they ARs, like this one. You know, choose smart though. Like if you're going for an 18 inch build, look very carefully at the weight. I just looked at a CMMG barrel, barrel versus AR Stoner. Without fluting, it was four ounces, four and a half ounces heavier. How about muzzle devices? We're coming to the end. How about be careful here too? I see a lot of guys put on some ridiculous muzzle devices. You know, and big ones that hey they do this they do that a lot of i don't know message board uh, phenomena comes into play here this is the best ever so and so uses this one he swears by it so i'm buying it i wish i knew all the names i don't offhand but maybe i'll roll in a photo here and there these are the ones i'm talking about if, if it's adding more than three ounces to the tip of my my barrel i'm really asking why i have it on the gun if I'm a competitor, it's less of a factor. I told you we're coming to this, and here it is again. There, like John Paul and his muzzle brakes, they make a lot of sense. You know, the fat bastard muzzle brakes in that application make a lot of sense because we're not really concerned about muzzle weight there. We actually like weight because it's our friend to stabilize a shot. Same could be said about long range precision rifles. But for most of the realistic AR 15 applications, go with something super light. That's why you see me running the battle comps. Super lightweight. Now, I'm not going to go crazy and buy one made of titanium. I mean, this is what? The Griffin M4 SD2, I forget. That's good. Is it the best in the world? Well, I don't know. There's probably a lot better than that. But remember what I said about the industry. They're going to run a lot of interference to convince you, dude, you will shoot so much better with our mu muzzle device. Eh, maybe. Not that much. If you're a seasoned combat competitor, remember those microseconds I was talking about. That's when a muzzle device really comes into play. The guys are playing games, they're running, and I'm talking about in a competition, they're going for points, they have to shoot fast. Then it might make a difference for someone you know, who's really, really good. For me, I don't think I'm that good where uh, I like it. I like the gun to be stable and rapid fire, stay on target, but I'm not gonna go out and spend $200 you know, pitch what I have and go change it. This is good enough. It's totally good enough. This is a proprietary unit on this Smith & Wesson. I haven't changed it out, nor am I planning to. It's good enough. It's their enhanced flash hider, proprietary to Smith & Wesson. It's longer than I would like. That's what she said. <clears throat> but, dude, it's, it's good enough. So be careful what you hang off there. You know, the war pigs or whatever, you can really dick it up. Know what your philosophy of use is. If it's com competition long range, then maybe it makes sense. Last but not least, suppressors. I need a can. Get something like this. This is a, I think, a titanium Trek 556. This is a lightweight SAWC compliant can. Says me. Uh, I love it. It is so excellent. And it won't really disrupt the swing of either of these guns. Screws on. But dude, you need a quick release way to put that on. Ah, do you? Do you really need that? Or is that just the industry selling us something we don't need? If it doesn't add weight, if it is SAWC compliant, I'm cool with it. I don't care what brand you're talking. Hey, my flash hider that has an integrated suppressor attachment on it, only weighs 3.5 ounces. Awesome. What's the weight on that? Ah, five and a half ounces. I'm out. But you have to screw off your flash hider. So what? Dude, if I know I'm gonna be running a can, guess where the can's gonna be? On the gun. I don't care if it's cute, quick release. You think special operations are gonna say, hey, I'm gonna start the operation with the can off, and then I'm gonna put the can on. 
The only time I could really see that is if you know it's going to be a, a pure full auto firefight. In which case, this titanium can would not make a lot of sense. It's going to overheat. You'll need steel. So in terms of firepower versus mobility, if you're talking about a lot of volume of fire, you got to go steel. Otherwise, it just won't work. I go lightweight, though. And really ask yourself, do I even need a can? It's cool. It's fun. It does open up capabilities. But are you ever going to use it other than recreationally? Is it worth the money, the registration, the tax hassles? You make the call. I got to wrap it up. This has been a super fun video for me. Super fun. Dude, you are hanging way, way too much crap on your AR-15. And we've all done it. Maybe this helps focus you if you're a newer AR-15 user. Maybe, maybe you're experienced and you didn't realize that you were doing it. And you're like, whoa, dude, nothing's right. I, I got to pare things down. The goal should, again, be about seven and a half pounds. This one, completely outfitted, is eight pounds, two ounces. That's with a GI 30-round magazine in it. That's Smith & Wesson. And that's with these short rails on it. To me, that's in the, the game. This one is going to be about the same weight. Maybe a little bit less. Watch the weight. For a gun you want to have with you to get into action quickly, you know, you don't need a lot of crap on your ARs. You can just run iron sights. You may not, like we discussed, need optics. You might need optics, maybe you don't. Think about it, you might just get away with irons. Oh, one thing, I gotta mention this really super quick, are lights. Lights are a very important part of an AR-15 weapon system. For CQB, and probably not long range. I'm not gonna be illuminating a guy at 600 yards. It just won't work with current technology. And if I did, I'm an idiot. I should be bugging out and going away. Lights are good, but a good ballpark, six ounces or less, completely for the light. The Maelstroms for, by 4.7s did this. Surefire has some, fall, falls into that category. Put out a ton of light. Be very careful what light you put on. And then ask yourself, do I really need a light with the application. For an all-purpose CQB AR, light's good weight. It's gonna slow down the swing weight, but you're not gonna see what you're shooting at in dark places. That's why you see guys doing house to houses in Fallujah, they had lights. You know, I'm thinking if they didn't really need it, they wouldn't have it, but they had it. Lights are necessary, just choose super smart. Super lightweight, cost-effective. There are a bazillion choices out there got to wrap it up the best thing you can do really is just be a good marksman you know like I said at the outset one reason guys put so much crap on the ARs is they think it's going to make them a better shooter it, it doesn't I shoot guys like this and they'll make excuses oh my scope's off yeah my trigger's out of whack I didn't really mention the trigger because it doesn't really play directly to a lot of crap i.e. I more weight on the gun no it's not not all the stuff it's just you don't know how to shoot. <laughs> Sorry. That's my best advice at this point. Thank you for watching. Thanks for subbing. Okay, let's move on. Stay on this one, dude. Just stay on that one.